Well, good morning, everyone. As uh, he said, I'm Juan Hernandez. I'm a professor at uh, Bethel University. I've been there for 14 years. Um, born and raised in Camden, New Jersey. My parents are from Puerto Rico, and they came over in the 60s. We grew up bilingual, bicultural. Long story short, so we can jump right into the material. I was born and raised Catholic, had a conversion experience at a Pentecostal church uh, at the age of 15, started studying the word, and one thing led to the other, and I ended up in New Testament land. Um, the reason I'm at Bethel uh, University is because when I was working on my dissertation way back, um, I had an idea of working on a particular project. And the project was very complicated. I wanted to work on the manuscripts of the book of Revelation. And I could not find a single scholar in the world who was interested in my topic. I would email scholars from England, France, Germany, Italy, US. Everybody was like, no, too complicated, or who are you, or you know, is there anybody there who can help you? And we had a nice New Testament faculty, but we needed someone who was a specialist in Greek manuscripts, and there was no one. Well, my last option was an email sent to me by a former professor saying, well, what about Mike Holmes at Bethel University? And Mike Holmes is essentially an expert in the textual criticism of the New Testament, had been teaching at Bethel for like 30 years. He is the one person in the world who took an interest in my idea. He said, Juan, I like your idea, we'll work with you. I was at Emory University, that's where I was doing my PhD, and they invited him down to be an outside reader. So it's literally a story of mentorship. He came, he read through my chapters, he assisted me in the committee with our work, and as I was finishing up my dissertation, I get a call from him saying, hey Juan, I'm taking off my hat as a professor at Bethel, or as, as your reader, and I'm putting on the hat as a Bethel professor, and I just want to let you know I'm chair of the department, and we have an opening at Bethel University. Would you be interested? My immediate impulse answer was no. <laughs> I had never been to Minnesota. I'm from the East Coast. I assumed that there were only corn stalks, like the ones I saw here. I thought that that's all there was in Minnesota. I didn't know anybody. Uh, we had just had a baby, so the idea of taking the grandchild away from the grandparents, I mean, it was like, you know. But he had invested in my work. He contributed. He mentored. He loved. He corrected. And I felt like, you know, I at least owe him uh, an interview. Right? So I ended up going. It was uh, spring in Atlanta. I get to Minnesota, it's winter, right? <laughs> I mean, it was March, and there are dogwoods everywhere, nice flowers in Atlanta, and I get over to, to Minnesota, and I'm looking down out of the plane, I just see patches of white and brown. It's just dead as can be. And I said, there's just no way. There's no way I'm coming here. I'm just, I'm just going to do it and say thank you. It pains me that I can't do it, but, you know, at least I can but I went and had a fantastic interview experience, uh, learned that the people were wonderful and supportive and, and, and just there was a body of people you know, wanting to learn and uh, ended up going there. My daughter was one month old and uh, starting my 14th year there at, at Bethel uh, University. That actually was my connection to this camp, which I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce. This is my first time in Iowa and at first I was saying Okabajoe right? <laughs> I'm still working on it. So if I refer to the camp, the camp, the camp, you think, I think you'll know which one it is. Um, so uh, last fall, I had a, uh, a teaching, again, I've been teaching there for 14 years in the New Testament department. By the way, that uh, project that I had worked on ended up uh, getting published, winning an award. I ended up getting invited to the British Library to present on it. So, so the work that I did with Mike Holmes just really catapulted everything. So it was, you know, it's a wonderful blessing. So last, last uh, fall, I think it was, or, or last year, I was teaching a, a Greek class, a third-year Greek class and an issues class. And there was a student in that class uh, with connections to this place, but I didn't know it. I didn't even know of this place. Uh, the student was very unassuming, very quiet, uh, didn't say much, and, uh, you know, did his work, did everything he needed to do, you know, met all the standards. There was no problem, but I could not read this student as to whether he enjoyed the class or thought I was nuts or, or what, right? We got through the two classes, and again, this is Greek three and, and a, a seminar class. 
And at the end of the semester, the student comes to me and says, hey, you know, Juan, I just want to let you know, I, I told my mom about your classes, and we, we think, you know, we'd like to invite you to come to our camp. And this was uh, uh, Van Clay, Ross Van Clay, right over there, uh, a famous Clay family. I mean, I had no idea, I, you know, I had no idea. So, so contrary to my expectations, uh, Mr. Unassuming over there was, uh, was paying attention, and uh, it resulted in this wonderful invitation and this, this new experience. So all that said, I'm thrilled to be here. It's just a quick, quick background about who I am, what I do. I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk during the week. And uh, I'm particularly thrilled to talk about the Gospels. Uh, this is an uh, area that I love talking about, uh, just because the Gospels are so full of interesting details. They're mysterious. They're fantastic. They weave some wonderful narratives. And, and oftentimes I find that uh, we are predisposed to reading them a certain way, and we miss a lot that's there. So my goal for this week basically is to help you see what is in the Gospels, right? I want you to see what's in there. I want you to read it. I want you to understand it. I still am learning. Every time I come back to these, I find something else. I see another connection. And it's just, it's just endlessly amazing to me. And I will tell you, sometimes what you find is shocking, right? You realize there are things there that you never knew were there. Or passages that you thought you understood that you realize, no, I don't understand that at all. And what ends up happening is God starts to challenge our reading practices. We have a certain way of reading the Gospels that we've inherited over centuries of church tradition. And you have a sense, I know the narrative, I know what it's about, this is the story, this is how it goes, this is how it connects. And then when you really take a close look, you're like, well, wait a minute, there's more going on here than meets the eye. And you don't realize that you have been prone and predisposed to reading and not reading certain things. And my idea here is simply this. If it's God's word, it's inspired, and if it's in there, he meant it to be there, even if it confounds us, right? Because otherwise, it'd be easy to put God in a box, right? Okay, so I'd like to start the way I usually like to start these classes, with a pop quiz. <laughs> now, you know, it's not a serious quiz, but let's say, let's say, uh, you know, you... Go to meet your creator this evening, right? Uh, something happens. You're on your way. You get to the pearly gates, and there's St. Pete, and uh, he's thrilled to see you. Glad you made it, right? And uh, he says, look, you know, uh, you know we, we just got to tighten up things a little bit around here, make sure the people that get in are the people that need to be here. You know, we've had a few slip-ins. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you've been going to church. You've been going to the camp. Okay. Okajobi? Okaboji? <laughs> See, I told you, I told you. It's going to be the camp. Okay. Going to the camp for years. And uh, so we just want to make sure you're credentialed, right, for the kingdom. So let's start off real simple, real simple. How many gospels are there? Four. All right. You're, 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 you're on your way. <laughs> and then Pete says, okay, uh, that's good. So let's, let's focus on, on three of them. Let's leave John out. I mean, John is real. We're leaving John, by the way, for the very end because he really is a maverick. I mean, he just is out to lunch. He does something very different than the three. But the three themselves are distinctive in their own ways. So Peter says, so, okay, you got three Gospels. Um, which one is the shortest? Mark. Mark. Fantastic. How many chapters? Although they weren't there originally, right? Those are written in the, the verses. But how many? 16, 16, great, great. So uh, presumably Matthew and Luke are much longer, right? Which of the two is longer, Matthew or Luke? Matthew, Matthew, boy, a little thin ice there. <laughs> you know, you don't want to hit the elevator down. Okay, so you've got Matthew. How many chapters? 28, great. I mean, think about that. Mark has 16. Matthew's got 28. What is that, like 12 more chapters? I mean, that's a lot of material. And Luke? 24, on your way to the kingdom. She's on a roll. Okay, all right, so you've got three Gospels um, of varying sizes. And um, I usually like to kind of do this little graph just to kind of show you what we've got. So imagine this is kind of the spinal column of each gospel. I think they'll, they'll put it up on the screen if you're far away. Oh, look, there I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's say this is uh, Matthew. 
And this is Mark. And this is Luke. And this, of course, represents the beginning of the gospel and the end of the gospel, each one of them, right? And we all know that they, they're fairly similar, right, when you kind of look at them, at least on, over the surface, right? So Peter just really needs to make sure. I mean, you know, anybody who's been to Sunday school probably could answer those questions. doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. Um, it's like a works righteousness seminar, right? <laughs> so um, what do you think... So if Mark is shorter, Mark obviously, or presumably, doesn't have things that Matthew and Luke have, right? So, what do you think Matthew and Luke, or Matthew by himself, or Luke have that Mark does not have? Okay, genealogy, genealogy, that's right. Mark's gospel, when Jesus shows up, he's a grown man, right? It just says the beginning of the gospel of Christ you know, da 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 da. Jesus, good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, right? That's it. And uh, he's a grown man. The closest thing to a genealogy in Mark's gospel is the name Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. That's all you know, right? So, which one has a genealogy, Matthew or Luke? Both of them, right? So you can you can add a nice chunk here to represent, you know, content. You've got Matthew and Luke. They both have genealogies. Peter's very interested in this, this uh, answer. That's wonderful. I mean, of course, it's the Christmas story, right? I mean, this is something you should have nailed down year after year of those manger scenes and those skits at church. You should know these stories. So, Peter says, what is the difference between those two genealogies? One's Joseph's, the other's Mary. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting. Because the idea that one is Joseph's and the other is Mary's actually comes from church tradition. If you read them both, they are both Joseph's. They're both Joseph's. Again, you know, and, and you, you will learn things here that perhaps you've never heard. And you will have to be like those Ephesians and go check, right? Hernandez, we got the heresy monitor on, you know, make sure, you know, he's not leading us astray. You feel free. You feel free, right? And then come back and apologize to me, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so you've got these two genealogies. And the reason why there is this uh, um, um, attempt to interpret it, well, one has to be of one person and the other, is because they are very different. And the fact of the matter is that we're very uncomfortable with those kinds of differences. Those kinds of differences are kind of a little bit of a stumbling block. Well, what do you do with that? My motto has been all along that, first of all, if there's a difference, it's an inspired difference, right? And I use that as a clue to try and understand what is it that the gospel writers are up to, right? So in other words, I may not be able to explain away the differences, but I could probably tell you what's going on, right, if you pay attention. So... So we've got two genealogies. So apart from the fact that people have labeled them differently, but when you read the text, it's not clear that that's the case. In terms of content, what's the difference? What does one have that another one doesn't have? Remember, just something small like eternity is in the balance here. <laughs> you carry your Bible all day, you should know this. This is the faithful. These are faithful. What's that? They go in different directions. I love it. That's right. One Matthew starts with the beginning and goes down, right? And actually, it's interesting because the, the genealogy starts, genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David. Now, David's not the first person in Jesus' genealogy. That's the title. That's a clue as to what this genealogy is about, son of David. And then it goes, son of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, da 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 all the way down, right? So it goes in that direction. Luke, on the other hand, had to be different, <laughs> goes in the opposite direction, starts with Jesus, and goes backwards, all the way down till he gets to what? What's that? Adam. Does he get to Adam? God. Yes. Adam, but then he goes, son of God, right? Now, that's very interesting, right? And you may ask, so why is it that Luke went in a separate direction and ends on son of God? 
right? I mean, this, one thing that I've discovered about uh, these Gospels is they are quite deliberate, right? Every move appears to have a particular function. And ending on Son of God is actually very strategic, right? If you'll recall in Luke's Gospel, uh, at the very beginning, there's a prophecy about Jesus, right? In the temple. And it says, you know, you will have, this kid will be the Son of God, Right? So, and that's the other thing to bear in mind. Matthew starts his genealogy in chapter 1. Luke doesn't start his genealogy till chapter 3. So he delayed it a little bit. And there are some stories that appear right before it. And one of them is about this announcement of the baby that's going to be born is going to be called Son of the Most High, Son of God. So right there, right, God through prophecy says this is God's Son, Right? And then in chapter 2, we have that famous and even funny, maybe even smart alecky story, right, about Jesus in the temple. His parents leave. It's like a Home Alone episode. His parents leave him behind, right? You know, Mary's like, where's Jesus? Joseph's like, I thought you had him. Blah, blah, blah. And Amber Alert goes out, right? And they rush back. And they find Jesus there in the temple teaching away. And they're like, you were driving us nuts. We thought we lost you. What does he say? Shouldn't I be about my father's business, i.e., God's son, right? So in chapter 1, there's a prophecy of him being the son of God. In chapter 2, Jesus himself bears witness as a child, I'm God's son, that's why I'm here. And then the genealogy just so happens to end on son of God, right? These writers were not illiterate. These were skilled writers, well-versed in Jewish interpretive traditions as they cobbled together and stitched together and put together these stories about Jesus as a way of teaching us something, right? We usually come to these stories almost like a CSI investigator, just the facts, ma'am. I just need to know what happened, what really happened, right? And, And there's that in there, but they're really trying to shape the narrative narrative in a way that will teach us something about Jesus, and not only about Jesus, but about ourselves. I mean, these ultimately are accounts that are meant to be uh, discipleship manuals. They show you how to live by looking at Jesus, by looking at the disciples, right? So now Matthew, Matthew's a little different. We know that he went in a different direction, doesn't end with the Son of God. What does Matthew's genealogy have that Luke's doesn't? Okay, yeah, so, so heavy emphasis on Judean kings, right? I mean, and David obviously would be a big part of that. As a matter of fact, David is such a pivotal part of this genealogy. Not only does he begin, you know, Matthew, you know, beginning, you know, uh, uh, genealogy, you know, son of David, right, and on. Um, David is mentioned two, three, four other times, right? Because the whole narrative is structured around David's reign, right? Um, Most of the kings here are Judean kings that show up. More Judean kings show up here than in Luke's, okay? So Davidic kingship is emphasized, right? What else does it have? What's that? Women. Women! Oh, my God, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Women are in Matthew's genealogy. And, you know, it's actually unexpected because Luke is the gospel writer who accords a more prominent place to women, right? He actually has a little, little section in chapter 8 where he, he names several women who were followers of Jesus and they were assisting him in the ministry. And, of course, in the book of Acts, you have women involved as well. So, so women have a prominent place in Luke's gospel, not so much in Matthew's, not the same amount, yet Matthew includes Four women. Actually, I gave that away. I was going to ask how many women. That's a freebie for the kingdom. You tell Peter you learned that at the camp. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay, there are four women, right? Okay, this is, you know, you, you want VIP status in the kingdom. You're going to have to name those women. What women did Matthew choose for this genealogy? And, you know, by the way, behind every man is a woman. Right? There should have been I mean, a dozen or so women as well, right? But there are four that are chosen. Must have been really special. Must have been indispensable to have them in there. What, what? 
What's that? Rahab. Oh, boy. Rahab, Ruth, Tamar. Well, Mary is, is number five. What's that? Bathsheba. Now, here's a, here's a pop quiz question, double pop quiz. Uh, is Bathsheba actually named? Wife of Uriah. Holy cow, that hurts. I mean, think about it, right? Whose wife was she ultimately? David's wife, right? And, you know, it's not as if Uriah was her last husband. Uriah was the guy that was what? Murdered by whom? David. David, the man after God's own heart, right? So there you have wife of Uriah. And it's not only the wife of Uriah. That stinks. If you're, if you're in, in, in a marriage where there's been more than one spouse, you know, you, that old spouse, you don't, don't bring that up, right? Here it is in the witness of Scripture. Wife of Uriah, the what? Hittite. So it's not even, I mean, this is the, this is the Savior's genealogy, and he's throwing in a Hittite among everything else. So, all right, so we got these four women. What do they have in common? Aside from being women, obviously. What's that? A little louder, right? Oh. Gentiles, Gentiles, that's right. Gentiles. Again, think about this. This is genealogy of the son of David, right? That's as Jewish as it gets. This is, Matthew's often known as the most Jewish of the Gospels, right? It's filled with Old Testament prophecies, right? Tailored to Jews. And what does Matthew go and do? Throw in some Gentile women. I mean, women was bad enough. Think about a patriarchal society, right? He's throwing in some women. I mean, not even Luke does that, right? Throw them in. But then he throws in these Gentiles. Tamar, what was she? Anybody remember? She was the daughter-in-law of Judah, but what uh, ethnic background was she? Canaanite. Canaanite. What do you do with the Canaanites in the Old Testament? You kill them, right? And there she is. Apparently, they didn't do that good of a job they're still running around okay so tamar is there canaanite and her story boy that's a doozy and get to that rahab jericho. jericho also a also prostitute also a canaanite right it's a special kind of gentile right <laughs> ruth moabite Moabite. Moabites have a very checkered past. You remember how the Moabites came into the scene? Incest. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Not that you want to talk about that, but <laughs> there it is. And then Bathsheba doesn't really give her ethnicity, but she's married to a Hittite, which would make her a Hittite. We don't know what, you know, she was really. Uh, the assumption is that, you know, she might have been a Hittite, she might have been a Jew, who knows. But she's associated with a Hittite, right? So you've got these four Gentile women. So they're women, they're Gentile, but they're of the variety that you're actually supposed to exterminate, right? I mean, you know, the Moabites as well. There's some very nasty things said about Moabites in the Old Testament, right? So, so you have a transformation going on here really significant and these are in jesus's family tree right it's kind of like you know how you do your ancestry.com i don't know if any of you have done that dna thing and try to get a family tree people get all excited about it oh you know i'm 30 percent scottish or whatever you know and you imagine yourselves as kings and whatnot you know you, you want to hide the family members that maybe don't bring so much honor to the family right you kind of keep them out yeah that's uncle so and so we really don't talk about him right uh, just erase him from the tree uh here they are right so women, Gentiles. And then what else do they appear to have in common? Well, the trust in God, that's the good part. But there's a, there's a, there's a, a negative part. Rejected. And why are they rejected? They were dirty. They were dirty. What about their stories? Adultery, right? There's all kind of uh, sexual things that go on with these. So th these are like the desperate housewives of the Old Testament, right? <laughs> so, you know, 
you know, you, you did not have Matthew say, oh, we're going to throw Eve in there and Rachel, right? All the, all the women, you know, Deborah, you know. No, he throws these in, right? And I mean, Tamar, you guys remember Tamar's story? First of all, we're all adults here. Is, there, is that true? Okay, because the, the story is very interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it tame. We'll keep it Sunday school. But Tamar, as you know, she was married to uh, whose son? Judah. You guys remember what his name was? Oh, well, Judah is Judah, but her, his son. Again, this, is, this might be beyond Peter's, you know, Peter, if he's throwing this at you, it's because you're going to get an extra special mansion in the kingdom, right? So she, Judah had a son that she was married to. The Bible says he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And what happened? God killed him. Do you know what his name was? Anybody? Ur, er, exactly. Ur. Er. You know what Ur er means in Hebrew? Evil. <laughs> this is the other thing that we will miss over and over again, is that in many spots the Bible reads like uh, Pilgrim's Progress, right? Where names have a significance. And if you don't know it in Hebrew, you're not, you're, you'll miss it, right? Ur er is just uh, one of these weird Hebrew names. That means evil. So evil did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he was killed, right? And you have this going on throughout Genesis in the story of Ruth. Every name in the book of Ruth has a meaning. And the meaning is a key to understanding what's going to happen in the story. But you don't know it, right? So you've got the Old Testament does that, the New Testament does well, but the Old Testament really goes to town. So back then, there was a thing called Leveret Laws, right? And what would happen if your son died... All right, the, the purpose of marriage back then was to raise children, have them help you out, you know, protect the family, etc. So he's gone. So Judah says, okay, I'll give you uh, my second son, right? Anybody remember what his name is? Extra special mansion on the line. <laughs> Nobody wants it. What's that? Onan, Onan exactly. Onan. And Onan, you guys will have to read the story, but basically he was supposed to raise children, and he prevented it. He prevented it, although he was married. And his job as being the brother who, you know, takes on his brother's wife was to give her children. He doesn't, and God kills him. Onan means trouble. It can also mean sorrow. I'm sure there was sorrow in that story. Okay, so Judah's like, Tamar's like a black widow. She's killing all the males. I mean, he might blame her. You know? And so there's one more son. Anybody remember? Yeah. Yeah. Is it Selah? Is that, is that Shayla, Selah? Something like that. But he's young, right? So she says, where he said, Judah says, look, I've got one more kid, but he's young. So... Um, why don't we just wait till he grows up and then you can have him? She says, fine, right? And years passed and she's wondering where this kid's at, right? And she was actually at the city gate, right? Uh, it's called the, the gate of Enaim. So she's at this gate, city gate, and it dawns on her, Shayla was never sent and that's where she gets the idea. You guys remember the story where she is basically going to dress as a prostitute and seduce him, right? Now, here are some interesting things about these names. Shayla, you know what that means? The one sent for. She never got the one that was sent for. And gate of Enaim in Hebrew is, is literally opening of the eyes. And that's this place where she, it dawned on her. Oh, my God. He never sent him. He never sent Shayla. Never shayla Shayla, right? And she's at the gate, open your eyes. So, of course, she dresses up. Judah walks into town. He sees her. And, you know, again, this is Old Testament ethics. <laughs> Nothing like the, the New Testament. And asks, how much? And uh, she tells him. And he says, well, I have nothing on me. So he gives her this little conical cynic signet thing that has kind of his signature and a staff and he says you know hold this as collateral right they do the deed and he departs right sometime later she's with child 
And the city people come to Judah and say, Your daughter, daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Which is a play on words. Because she did pretend to be a harlot. She was not. She pretended, but they're saying, no, she basically slept around. Bring her here. She must die. Right? That's immediate justice, right? She must die. They drag her in. And as he's there ready to pronounce the sentence, she says, whoever this belongs to and this belongs to is the father of this child. And he's like, oh, she is more just than I. Right? Let's her go free. Right? Now, what do you have there? You have a story of a Gentile who is just. The Leverett Law was, you, Mr. Judah, are to provide children. And that is through your sons. And you double-crossed her. And she took it into her own hands. But it was the right thing to do. And she's justified. And she earns a spot on the genealogy of Jesus. Right? Now, you got to, you know, as you read this, this is not just about the past. Remember that Matthew's gospel is being written at a time where Christians are not just just Jews. you got Gentiles coming in, right? All of whom may fit the bill. And there they are in the genealogy of Jesus, right? And the genealogy of Jesus, which is, you know, peppered with these Gentiles, is just the beginning. At the very end, the last thing Jesus says when he goes up to a mountain, he says, go into all the nations, which are Gentiles, right, and teach them. So it begins with Gentiles and it ends with Gentiles, right? So you've got Tamar. Rahab, of course, we all know. She was also a prostitute. They're also word plays. I'll spare you those word plays. Um, she protects the spies who are scouting out the land. And she says, when you conquer it, take me with you, right? Um, Ruth as well. Ruth, you know, when her mother-in-law is leaving Moab, when the famine is over and they're going back to Judah, she says, uh, you know, uh, take me with you. And interestingly, Ruth's story is very similar to Tamar in that she wants to follow her because her husband, you know, had died. And she's like, you know, uh, what, what was her mother-in-law's name? Naomi. Naomi. By the way, all the names also are, are significant. Naomi means pleasant. Ruth means friend, right? See, or companion. So Ruth says, no, I, I want to go with you. Naomi says, don't come with me. I have no more children to give you, right? She's like, no, no, I'll go with you. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. And there you have a Moabite converting, right, uh, to Judaism. By the way, do you guys remember what Ruth's sister, what, what her sister's name was? Naomi. Orpa. Orpa, not Oprah, Orpa. You know what Orpa means in Hebrew? Back of the neck. So in other words, she turned her back. She gave her neck to Naomi and she stayed in Moab, right? Really interesting, the, the two kids, Malon and Kilion, both of their names have to do with sickness and, and pain and they both died young. Uh, the father, uh, his name meant uh, my God is king. This was a period where there were no judges, Right? No, no kings, so they were just judges. Oh, and by the way, there's one person in the book of Ruth that has no name. And it's at the end of the story, there's one person, one potential suitor, one potential husband for Ruth, right? And uh, this is before Boaz accepts. He has to give preference to this other guy. And the other guy doesn't want to do it. By the way, Boaz also is significant. Boaz means with strength, right? He's the one who's going to provide. He's going to protect. The guy who... Uh, turns her down and doesn't want to marry her. In Hebrew, it's Peloni Amoni, right? You know what that means? So and so. <laughs> so the story relegates him to nothing, right? He did not contribute. He's so and so. That's another thing that you often have. I mean, the Bible will give you an evil name, right? Or no name at all, right? It's kind of like the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus has a name, the rich man has no name, right? Anyway. Long story short, there's a lot going on in this genealogy. We're not even into the Gospels yet. And you're looking at these, and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? And of course, what, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, uh, Bathsheba. I mean, that was a, that's as a dastardly a story as it can get. Uh, there's so much uh, to say there. Okay, but we'll leave it at that. So you've got a genealogy with women. There's another interesting feature of Matthew's genealogy that you don't have in uh, Luke's. It's a structural feature. Take a sip of coffee while you 
Decide your fate in the kingdom. <laughs> Anything? Anything? What's that? No? All right. Any numbers involved here? You guys remember any numbers? 14. 14, right? Matthew's genealogy is structured into 14, 14, 14. 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. It's like, you know, from Abraham to David, 14 generations. From, from David to Babylon, 14 generations. From Babylon to, to Joseph and Mary and Jesus, another 14. Why 14? Right? We get the number three, right? We get uh, uh, the number seven, of course, right? One of the things that the Bible does repeatedly is use numbers in a symbolic way, right? 14 is one of those numbers. And uh, what's interesting about 14, there's this feature biblical scholars will talk about called gematria. Gematria. Gematria is essentially when you have kind of an alphanumeric code where letters equal numbers, right? And in the Hebrew alphabet, right, you have that, like one, two, three, aleph, base. So I'm going to write some Hebrew. You can say you learned some Hebrew at the camp, right? <laughs> So this is the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, Aleph, looks like an X. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth, He. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth, He. Vav, Pet. Okay. So this is kind of like A, B, G, D. All right. So this actually is no sound. B, G. It's kind of H sound. It's kind of a V sound, right? So these are, this is the beginning of the alphabet, right? So... Aleph is number one, Beit number two, Gimel three, four, five, six, seven, and on, right? Well, 14 just so happens to be the equivalent of the Hebrew name, anybody want to take a guess? David. David, David in the genealogy. So, D-V-D, which is Daleth, Vav, Daleth, is Four plus six plus four. Now, I'm not in the math department at Bethel, so help me. Four plus six, 10 plus four, 14, right? So 14, 14, 14 is an implicit way of saying David, David, David. So the genealogy is called son of David. David is mentioned a bunch of times in the genealogy at the beginning where he's supposed to be as a bracketing device. And then you've got 14, 14, 14. Now, if it were just that, right? And you're like, well, boy, Hernandez, that's a stretch. 14, 14, 14, you know, what, you know. Well, first of all, you go through the Old Testament, there's more than 14 times three generations, right? There's hundreds of generations. So this is clearly a stylistic device. Uh, Luke did not use the 14. He just went straight through. One of the things that Matthew is known for is for Old Testament prophecies, right? Everything Jesus does gets an Old Testament prophecy. Took a sip of water, fulfilled prophecy, right? It's just all over the place from beginning to end. Do you know how many Old Testament prophecies are cited in Matthew? 14. Not 13, not 10, not 12, 14. That cannot be an accident. Mark has less. Luke has some. John barely talks about Old Testament prophecies in that way. He kind of just weaves it into the narrative. That's another interesting thing about these uh, gospel writers. They all use the Old Testament in different ways. So, again, a very stylized account of the genealogy that taps into this notion of Jesus as the son of David. And by the way, in the, on the Sermon on the Mount, there are these uh, sayings that have like three lines. Like three lines, three lines, three lines, three lines. You know how many of those there are? 14, 14, right? So think about how long and what kind of work and what kind of thinking and what kind of meditation and what kind of learning and what kind of reflection on Jesus it took to put something together this complex that you don't even know it. You don't even notice it. I mean, it, re it doesn't read in a, as if it were difficult and weighted down with data. It's very free. But as you sit and you sip and you just think about it, and you learn, you're like, well, look at all of that. That's fascinating. That's just the genealogy. And we haven't even gotten to anything else, right? 
That's why we're going to take a week to go through all the Gospels. We haven't even gotten into Mark. That's what we're supposed to cover today. We'll get there at some point. Okay, so genealogy, genealogy. What else do Matthew and Luke have that uh, Mark does not have? Genealogy is one thing. What's that? Birth, birth, the infancy narratives. Now, interestingly, in Matthew's gospel, the infancy narrative comes after the genealogy, right? In Luke, it comes before. Now, again, this is a story we all know very well. This is a Christmas story, the manger, all of that stuff, Christmas plays, the infancy narratives. But we function or we, we, we understand them in a homogenized way, right? Everything is under the Christmas tree, right? The only thing missing, I think, is Pharaoh, right? Well, not Pharaoh, Herod, Herod, the, the, the one who killed the innocents. But if I were to ask you, how does each tell the infancy narrative? What's the difference between their accounts? And, and remember this, when the Gospels were first written, they circulated independently, right? And you wouldn't have your own Gospel that you held on to and read. Someone would deliver a Gospel to a church, it would be read, it would move on, right? So the notion of we have the whole story looks very different in the first century, where you did not have something you could just pull up on a phone or reach into a shelf, read, reread, go back and forth. You heard it. You heard the story. Maybe you memorized portions of it. You certainly weren't making comparisons. We do that. And, in many, and interestingly, a lot of the difficult questions we face is because we have a glut of data that was never available before. Okay, so birth narratives, right? Birth infancy stories. What's the difference? Well, what does one have that the other one doesn't have? Yes? I don't know, but maybe one, it wasn't really all expected. The other one, all of a sudden, it's just talk. Okay. Yeah, and one, it just looks like, hey, this is all part of the unfolding story. Beautiful. The other one's a shock, right? Which one's a shock? Luke? You want to make it into the kingdom? It's Matthew. <laughs> and Matthew. Okay. So, so what? Ha- how does it develop in Matthew? Anybody remember Matthew? Dreams. Angel visits. This is Matthew. Okay. So, there's a visitation by an angel in Matthew, but it's in a dream, and it is not to Mary, but to Joseph. Right. The angelic visitation is in Luke to Mary. By the way, in Luke, Joseph has no speaking parts. Doesn't say a word. It's as if he's just a, a prop on a stage. In Matthew, Mary has no speaking parts. Right? So again, you would never know that, right? Unless you're actually reading these. Matthew's scene is the one that features the Magi. Matthew's infancy narrative is dark and ominous, right? Remember the Magi? They see the star, and what had to be the worst idea on the planet occurred to them. They're going to go to Herod, who for all intents and purposes was the king of the Jews. And they say to him what? Yeah, we're going to go find the king of the Jews. You know, we saw his star. It's like a joke. It's like a joke. And this guy was a megalomaniac, right? It's not like he thought that was a great idea. So when he says, oh, let me know so I can go worship him, we know that that's not really what he's interested in, right? So it's kind of a joke. Magi, by the way, are like Eastern, you know, stargazers. They read the stars. Those are Gentiles, Gentiles, again, they're the first ones. We saw his star. We're going to go, right? So they go down. They find Jesus. Herod is fooled by them, right? Remember that? And and he loses it. And what does he do? He says, all the boys, two years and under, gone, right? And what happens to the family? They escape to Egypt. Egypt. Until Herod dies, the Magi go back in a different direction. And then when they come back, they go back to another part. And that's how they end up in Bethlehem. Right? Now look at that. That's, and by the way, when Mary is pregnant, Joseph was left out in more ways than one. Not only was he a non-participant, 
But it came as a surprise. I mean, he looks over at his bride, and by the way, you know, this is how culturally distant we are from those times. How old do you think Mary would have been? She would have been just puberty age. She could have been 12, 13. How old would Joseph have been? He could have been 20 or over. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing someone goes to prison for nowadays, right? This is a very different culture. And he looks over, and his you know, bride-to-be is pregnant. You tell me what you would think if a 12 or 13-year-old said to you, this is God's. It does, just doesn't fly, right? He didn't even discuss it. He was like, well, I'll put her away quietly. And that's where an angel comes in. And says, don't be afraid to take your wife, you know, or take Mary. This is, this is God's doing. Very ominous story, full of anxiety and fear and mystery and kind of, whoa, what's this? Shock, right? And they make it to Bethlehem. No shepherds, no angelic singing, right? And not only that, this story is interesting because it resembles a story from the Old Testament, who has similar circumstances at their birth from the Old Testament? Moses, Moses that's right. Moses, right? The, her- the, the uh, uh, Pharaoh realized, hey, these Israelites are multiplying, right? And they're going to overpower us, so we're going to have to cut down that population. So he has all of the boys who are born, right, ordered killed. Moses was at risk, Right? And those are the circumstances through which he came, right? Interestingly, that takes place in Egypt. Jesus was in Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. When Jesus comes out of Egypt, he goes where eventually? Into the desert, right? 40 years in the desert, 40. You know, you got all these interesting parallels in Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus that are similar to Moses. Those are not just accidental because as we get to Matthew, we're going to find over and over again in almost every chapter that Matthew is also drawing parallels with Moses. So Jesus is not only the son of David, and that'll be clear in implicit and explicit ways, he is also the prophet like Moses, right? Moses had promised, after I'm gone, a prophet will raise up like me. Listen to him. That's Jesus. And that's what Matthew is showing us. So again, really, really interesting uh, uh, turn of events here. Uh, Jesus's trajectory is like Moses. Luke, on the other hand, it's festive, it's happy. It's like the sound of music. Right? Oh, it's just a, just a musical, right? So what do you have? Mary's visited by an angel. Blessed are you among women. The child you're going to have is God. Oh, I've never known a man. Don't worry about it. God's got the details, etc. Right? And not only is she happy and excited, but she goes to her cousin. What was her name? Elizabeth, Elizabeth right? Who happens to be what? Pregnant. Pregnant. With whom? John the Baptist, Jesus' second cousin, right? And, and what does the baby do when he hears the news? He leaps in the womb, and, and they're singing songs, and it's happy. Nothing from Joseph. Not a word, right? And it's, it's festive, and that's where you have the shepherds. Now, there's a Herod involved, but he's just doing a census early on. There's no killing of the innocents, right? It's, it's a, and, and you have this emphasis on Jesus, interestingly, also in a different way as son of David. Because right? where is Jesus born? The city of David, which is? Bethlehem, right? And the shepherds. Who was a shepherd? David was a shepherd, right? So you got all of these interesting allusions there as well. Right? So you have these narratives that tap into different parts of the Old Testament and tell us significant things about Jesus' identity, who he was, right? Uh, by the way, Mark... Joseph never shows up in Mark's gospel. If you find him there, I'll give you five bucks. <laughs> because the Bible you're carrying is corrupt. <laughs> There's no Joseph. As a matter of fact, what do we know Joseph as? What was he? What was his line of work? Oh, my God. Do we really just have uh, eight minutes left? Jeez. Oh, this is just the intro. <laughs> they told me you guys like Bible, so I, I, I can't imagine this would be horrible. Okay, so you've got... Uh, Joseph is a what? Carpenter, right? In Mark's gospel, when the people start inquiring about Jesus, they say, isn't this Jesus the carpenter? 
right? There's no son of the carpenter. Matthew's gospel says son of the carpenter. But in Mark, it just says Jesus the carpenter. There's no Joseph whatsoever, right? Which is really fascinating. Mark, by the way, according to scholars, is the earliest gospel. So this would have been the earliest account circulating. Matthew and Luke would have come later, right? Filling in some gaps, etc. So, You've got some interesting details about the parentage of Jesus, the infancy narratives. You also have uh, the genealogy. Other interesting things are uh, kind of the, the, the overall structure of the gospel. I'll give this to you in these last few minutes. So all of the gospels have, um, get some space on here, the same kind of direction, right? So, so they'll have different details, but they have the same Direction. So they all go from Galilee to Judea, right? G, J, G, J, right? So they all go in a southerly direction. And there's usually like a little point where they make that transition, where Jesus is in Galilee, and then he decides, okay, we're going to go to Judah, and that's where he faces his fate, Right? Interestingly, in Mark's gospel, it's just one verse, right? He's in Galilee, I'm going to head to Judah. Next verse, he's in Judah or Judea, right? Same thing in Matthew. Galilee, going to Judea. Luke, on the other hand, does something interesting. He has that transition between Galilee and Judea, but he opens it up and gives you the road trip, right? How long it took. And basically what you have is... That one verse is opened up, and you have about 10, 11 chapters of material here. Most of it, material that you don't have in the other Gospels, right? They know, this is known as the travel narrative, right? And it's, it's almost like one of those stories, you ever watch one of those comedies, or it's kind of like road trip, right? Here's a road trip, all kinds of crazy things happen, right? This is kind of the road trip part of Luke's Gospel, you don't have a road trip in Mark, you don't have it in Matthew, but you have a road trip that's like 10, 11 chapters, and he includes in there all sorts of new material. There's old material too, but new material. It's a big structural change. So they all go in one direction, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Judea, Galilee, Judea. But Luke, you've got this big parentheses. Matthew has his own parentheses, but it's probably best to think about them as speed road bumps, right? Speed, speed blocks, right? So you got, you've got uh, teaching sections. And Matthew injects one, two, three, four, five major teaching sections in his gospel, right? So it'll start out with Jesus, signs and wonders, signs and wonders, and then boom, three chapters where it's just teaching, 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 signs and wonders, signs and wonders, boom couple of chapters of teaching, teaching, teaching. He does that five times. Now, some of this material comes from Mark, as does the material from Mark and Luke. Some of it is new. Some of it is different. By the way, what could the possible significance of five teaching blocks be? Five books of? Moses. There's another parallel to Moses there. Now, no, he doesn't tell you that. Matthew doesn't say, by the way, Jesus is like Moses. Look, he's got five books. But for the alert, perceptive, sensitive reader, Jewish reader in particular, oh, that's, boy, his birth circumstances were like Moses. And like Moses, five major teaching sections, right? These teaching blocks serve the same function as the travel narrative. Lots of teaching. By the way, what is Jesus known for doing? What is his favorite teaching method parables parables right so in mark you've got parables matthew you've got more parables right luke you also have parables by the way john's gospel not one single solitary parable in that gospel zero none which is astounding right luke however in this travel narrative includes 10 parables that are found nowhere else. Some of the most famous parables are only found in Luke's gospel. One of the most famous 
Anybody think about one of the most famous ones? The good, the good Samaritan. Everybody knows that the drunk on the street would know the good Samaritan, right? That's the premise for giving me money, right? Good Samaritan. Only Luke has it, right? The prodigal son. Only Luke has it, right? So 10 parables found nowhere else. Really fascinating. All right, and to wrap up, I think I've got three minutes. The other interesting thing that Matthew and Luke have that Mark does not is the resurrection narrative. Resurrection narrative. Mark has no resurrection narrative. Now, you may see, if you look at your Bibles at 16.8, there'll be a note that says some ancient manuscripts include a longer section. The oldest manuscripts end at Mark 16.8. Mark 16.8 is when the women go to the tomb... The man at the tomb says, uh, he's not here, he's gone to Galilee ahead, and it says, they went away afraid. The last word in Mark's gospel is afraid. Now, he had been predicting all along he was going to rise from the dead. And here it's clear that he has, because they say he's gone ahead before you. But there's no depiction of it. You don't see the resurrected Christ. You don't have him talking to any. The women get there, they're just going there to anoint his body. And he's gone. And they leave in fear. Right? That's kind of typical in Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is a very fast-paced gospel. Right? Everything happened quickly, 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 quickly. You know, signs and wonders, signs and wonders. Then it slows down as he's facing his death. And then it ends with this open question. Did he rise from the dead? And they leave afraid. Matthew and Luke, they give us the story. Right? with all of its details and all of its significance. Well, I think that's good enough for an introduction. We'll start Mark tomorrow, I promise. Thank you. <laughs>